What happens one minute after you die? Well, that, that was the focus last week. If you were not here last week, and if you're curious about that, I would encourage you to get the, uh, the CD and listen. Because what we did last week is we said that there are actually three stages to our Christian lives. Stage one is what we're in right now, the, the living that we're in right now, the here and now. Stage two is one minute after I die and thereafter, we sometimes refer to it as going to heaven. Uh, that, the book Heaven by Randy Elkhorn that I've been featuring is called or he calls the intermediate state, and then the third state is the resurrection life, the resurrected state. That's after Jesus comes, our bodies have risen from the dead, resurrection. So what we're experiencing now, the here and now, and then the intermediate state, and then the resurrection state. And what I said last week, or actually what the Bible said, is that we have to get rid of this idea that I've got some kind of a puffy little thing inside called a soul, and that when I die, when you die, that that kind of floats off into the sky, that the soul goes to heaven. And I used Randy Elkhorn's term that he uses in the book, the book Heaven. He calls that Christoplatonism. That is, it's Christianity, Christian teaching, that is shaped and formed under the influence of the philosopher Plato, the Greek philosopher Plato. Plato taught that we are dichotomistic, that is, that we are divided into two parts, body and soul. And that was taught in the church down through the ages. In fact, you probably have heard that, we're body and soul. Well, we really aren't. I don't believe that that's good teaching. That's not good biblical. The Bible does not say that we are body and soul. The idea that I'm a body and inside of me, like if I could open up a little door, that inside is this puffy little marshmallowy thing that floats off into the sky when I die. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when I die, I go to be with the Lord. And I showed you last week with Bible passages that that will be a physical bodily existence. I don't know how God is gonna do that. I think it's, it's, it's on a different uh, dimension a dimension that we can't see and experience right now, like a fourth dimension, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, uh, but that it will be a, a real physical life that we will interrelate with other people so that when we say things like, well, mom and dad are now back together again, and mom is no longer in the wheelchair, but she's walking, and mom and dad are dancing again, and dad doesn't have his bad hip anymore, that that's true, that there is a physical aspect to that intermediate state. And I was telling you the last week, and I, and I heard this from other people, uh, telling you last week that that idea, as I gleaned it out of the scriptures uh, uh, under the direction of this book, Heaven by Randy Elkhorn, uh, that that really gave me a, a, a much better feeling about death. That this idea that you die and you just sort of float off and kind of bounce around in the universe for a while uh, did not interest me. And I think the reason it didn't interest me is because it isn't true. We, we exist in that intermediate state in a real, physical, personal way. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1, I go to be with Christ. So that was last week. Now, today is that third stage, the resurrection stage, in which our bodies rise from the dead and they are real bodies. Now, I don't know how God does this, to transition from that, that intermediate state where we have a physical existence into the resurrection. I, I don't know how he does that, but we'll let God figure that out. But the, the body that I have right now, the body of people that die, put into the ground or whatever, whatever cremated, uh, buried at sea, uh, that rises from the grave, whatever that grave may be, and it is a real body never to die again. That is the cardinal teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
We're going to look at several verses. It's a long chapter, but we're just going to look at some selected verses, starting off with verses 12 through 14. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. So what the Apostle Paul is saying in these opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15 is, the resurrection of Jesus is true, and also our own resurrection. And you've got to believe both of them. If you deny one, you deny the other. And that is, that is right at the roots of our Christian faith. The fact that Jesus rose and that we will rise. Well, let's go on and look at verse 42 through 44. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown, that is put into the ground, is perishable, but it is raised imperishable. It will never perish again. The body that is sown in dishonor, that is, it decays, it's got bad hips, you know, bad vision, it's beginning to lose its uh, ability to think and remember, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. Now, we're going to get to that word spiritual body in a few minutes. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Spiritual body, as we're going to see, does not mean that you're like a ghost, uh, that you're wispy and, and full of air. It, it means something else. We're going to get to that in just a little while. But what Paul is teaching here in Corinthians is that there is a real resurrection. And then some of the concluding verses in that chapter, these are exceptionally uh, uh, amazing verses and for many people very familiar. It says in verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That is, we will not all remain in our graves, but we will all be changed. For in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised imperishable. That is, they will not die again. And we will be changed. For the perishable must be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. That is, not to die again. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. It's out of that passage that we get that famous hymn, Victory in Jesus. So real bodies being raised from the dead. And, and, and if we have real bodies that are going to live, we need to have a real earth in which to live. Bodies are not going to be suspended in the air. They have to have earth, trees, rivers, animals, each other. There has to be an earth. And it says in the Bible that there is going to be such an earth. You remember last week I said that that physical existence in the intermediate state, God has created cities for us to live in? Well, the city is going to come down to a refreshed a renewed earth. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, starting at verse 1, says, And I saw, and, and the English words here are a bit unfortunate. Uh, it, it, I, I'm going I'm to translate it into English the way that it really should be, according to the original Greek words, uh, uh, have meaning. And then I saw a refreshed sky and a refreshed earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, the evil in them, the corruption, passed away, and there was no longer any fear. Sea is symbolic of fear. Moving on. And I saw the holy city. Now, here's the city that was in the intermediate state where people are living in a real physical existence. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the sky, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The idea of an earth that has been refreshed and renewed. You see, the word new there in the original Greek is, is the Greek word kainos. And the word kainos means to be refreshed, to be renewed. If you took a shower this morning, you're really tired. You, you know, had sleepers in your eyes, your hair was a mess, and you went into the shower when you came out, you just felt like a new person. Now, it doesn't mean you didn't exist before, but you've been refreshed, you've been restored, you've been renewed. That's what that word means. Well, I came across a passage in the Old Testament in which Isaiah is predicting the coming of that refreshed, that renewed sky and earth. Look at what he says in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. It says that there will be new heavens and the new earth. Well, I wondered, is the word new here in the Greek Old Testament, the same word kainos, meaning that it's going to be a refreshed earth, not a brand new earth, like the first one actually being eliminated, being annihilated and gone, but a refreshed earth. And the answer is yes. I checked in my, it's called the Septuagint. It is the Greek version of the Old Testament, and it has the same word, the word kainos. And so what it is saying is, what Isaiah is saying is, that he sees in the future that there will be a refreshed sky refreshed universe and a refreshed earth that I will make endure before me, declares the Lord. You see, if God eliminated this earth, if he got rid of it, it, it would be almost as if Satan had won because this earth was made by God. This is my father's world, says the old hymn. God made the universe, God made the stars, God made the earth. And if he get, gets rid of it, if he wipes it off the, the face of existence, it's kind of like Satan wins, but God wins. And so God doesn't get rid of the earth and he doesn't get rid of the moon and the stars and the planets and the universe. He refreshes it. He renews it. In that book, Heaven, by Randy Elkhorn, you're going to find quotes from many, many different biblical scholars, biblical teachers, uh, theologians. And one of them, I was amazed to see, what Randy Elkhorn, one of them is a person who was my professor at Calvin Seminary, a strong Calvinistic person by the name of Professor Dr. Reverend Anthony Hukuman. And I thought, wow. Here's a modern book which is giving us a fresh view of things, and he uses quotes from a guy. He's passed away, Dr. Hukuma has. He's using quotes from a Calvinist who taught at Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids 50 years ago. And, and here's one of his quotes. Dr. Hukuma says, Resurrected bodies are not intended just to float in space or to flit from cloud to cloud. Resurrected bodies require a renewed earth on which to live and to work, glorifying God. The doctrine, the teaching of the resurrection of the body, in fact, makes no sense whatever apart from the doctrine of the refreshed earth. Hmm. And, and Randy Elkhorn himself affirms that idea. He says that our lives now in this world are lives in which we should be anticipating that refreshed earth and universe to come. He says, the best parts of the old world were sneak previews of this one, like little foretastes, like licking the spoon from mama's beef stew 
an hour before supper. He says, when you lick the spoon, mama's beef stew, an hour before supper, you are anticipating what you're going to experience, and you anticipate it with the very thing that you're going to have. The idea then would be to stand alongside the Grand River and imagine it as being pristine, crystal clear. You can see the bottom. Uh, standing on, on the edge of Lake Michigan, uh, the beach, there is no old uh, dead fish rotting, uh, no seaweed that is rotting with a, a smell. It's just perfectly beautiful. See, and, and what you do then is you lick the spoon. You, you anticipate by standing in this world, you, you look at the, the plants and the trees and the flowers, and you say, this is what we're going to experience in that life to come. And it, it, and it is going to be it is going to be like this, which we're already enjoying, but better yet. It's going to be better yet. It's going to be more beautiful and more perfect yet. You lick the spoon. You taste the stew an hour before you're going to eat it. You experience that refreshed world by looking at this one. You might say licking the spoon of this world. I, I like that idea. That is really neat. Now, now, you say, well, how is that going to happen? How is it going to happen that, that, that this world with all of its sin and corruption and, and evil and you know, garbage and plastic in the ocean and all of that is suddenly going to become pristine and beautiful. How's that going to happen? Is God going to kind of snap his fingers and make it happen? And the answer is no. The Bible teaches very clearly that God is going to cleanse this world and all of its corruption with fire. You find that in 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Verse 7, and then also 10 through 13. It says, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. And then going to verse 10 through 13. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens, that is the sky, will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. That is, all of the corruption is going to disappear. All of the evil, all of the junk, the garbage, the sin is going to be gone. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a refreshed, a renewed sky and a refreshed and a renewed earth where righteousness dwells. So how is God going to do it? He's going to burn off all the corruption. He's going to burn it off. And again, he's not going to make it disappear. He is going to cleanse it with fire. Hukuma, again, Dr. Hukuma, he says... We need to realize that God will not be satisfied until the entire universe has been purged of all the results of man's fall. God will not be satisfied until the entire universe has been purged of all of the results of the fall. Ooh. He also says, Dr. Hukuma again, in his redemptive activity, God does not destroy the works of his hands. He doesn't destroy the earth, but cleanses this earth and the heavens from sin and perfects them so that they may finally reach the goal for which he created them. This principle means that the renewed earth to which we look forward will not be totally different from the present one, but will be a renewal and glorification of the earth on which we now live. So in that uh, new world, my tomato plants 
will be basically the same, except there won't be worms eating them. There won't be tomatoes that are rotting on the vine. It's going to be good, going to be great, going to be beautiful. And so what I need to do is I need to look at this creation, this world right now, and begin to anticipate what it's going to be like but someone might say, but wait a minute, if he's going to cleanse this world with fire, I, I, I realize that in the intermediate state, these people now are living in that city, and that's going to come down to this earth. But what if you're living on this earth when Christ comes, and there comes the fire? Uh, are we Christians going to get burned up with it? And the answer is no. He's going to get us out of here first. Look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, okay, the people in their graves, they're going to rise. There's that resurrection again. They're going to rise first. And then, after that, we who are still alive on this earth and are left on this earth will be caught up together with the resurrected people into the air, into the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so, in that way, we shall be with the Lord forever. Now, we're not going to be in the clouds forever, but we're going to be with the Lord forever. And then after the cleansing has occurred, then that city, including those of us who were alive at the time of the second coming, will come down to that refreshed and renewed and restored earth. Wow. Wow. So what kind of bodies are these going to be? And what will they be doing in that refreshed earth? Well, they're going to be doing the same thing they're doing now. First of all, once again, they're going to be real bodies. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. But remember I said hang on to that idea of spiritual body, that we'd come back to it? Let's look again at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 through 44. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. That is a real body that isn't going to perish. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power. It is a natural body going into the ground, but a spiritual body at the time of the resurrection. Okay. It's important that we take a look at that word spiritual body. Because someone might get the idea that we're going to be raised as, like a ghost. It's not what the Bible teaches. See, the word spirit in the Bible, really, the word spirit just means air. It means breath. That's, that's what the word originally means. It means breath, air. We're not going to be raised as a, just a bunch of air, or as a breath. What I believe the Apostle Paul is getting at here is this. The present time, we are under the authority of, the characteristics of, the nature that has fallen. Natural body means that we are subject to, oh, where'd it go? Put it back up there again. We are subject to, we are subject to fallen nature. But when we are raised, we will no longer be subject to the demands, the characteristics of fallen nature, but we will now be under the domination of the Holy Spirit. Our physical bodies will be under the domination of the Holy Spirit. So I believe if I was going to be translating 1 Corinthians 15 here, I would put a capital S on the word spiritual. See, it's not a spiritual body in the sense that it's just a bunch of air or clouds or like Casper the friendly ghost, but it is a body which is no longer under, under the, the boundaries, the characteristics, the demands of fallen human nature, but it is now under the character and the demands of the Holy Spirit. So it's a real body which is now governed by, by the Spirit of God. 
So what will that body do? Well, same thing. Um, grow things, talk together, meet together, uh, govern. See, government authority is not something that resulted from the fall. Leadership and government was created by God. Adam and Eve had leadership over the garden. They had to govern the garden. Government leadership authority is something good created by God. It is the corruption that we sometimes call politics that is the result of the fall, the natural body. Randy Elkhorn, who wrote the book, he says, everything here and now is time spent with significant people playing together, talking together, eating together, reading together, crying together, praying together, charting the course of our lives together, and that's home. Home is where we're with the ones we love. The resurrected state, what we're talking about this morning, the resurrected state is just like that. We will be with people we love, doing the things we love. Growing things, baking in the kitchen, playing games together, talking, laughing. We'll be real people doing real things and governing will be given responsibility. Another Calvin College person, <laughs> quoted by Randy Elkhorn, is Dr. Richard Mao. And, and Dr. Richard Mao says, over and over again, the scriptures make this plain. The political power which has been so corrupted and twisted in the hands and hearts of sinful rulers must be returned to its rightful source. See, what he says is, we're, we're going to be leaders. We're going to have government. You may be put in, in a responsible position over a certain group of people to lead them, to guide them. But there won't be corruption. There won't be politics in that corrupted sense of the term. It, 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 it's taught in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, for example, Verses 2 and 3 says, Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Now notice, will judge the world. And if you are to judge the world, that is, if you are to be an authority in that world, are you not competent to judge now in trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Or in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, if we endure, that is, if we maintain our Christian faith, if we endure, we will also reign with him. We're going to reign with him. We're going to be like kings, governors, mayors, teachers, have authority. Once again, Randy Elkhorn, he says, prior to Christ's return, his kingdom will be intermingled with the world's cultures. His followers are growing in character and proving their readiness to rule through adversity and opportunity, as well as in their artistic and cultural accomplishments. They are being groomed for their leadership roles in Christ's eternal kingdom. See, if... if for example, if you play the piano, you are being groomed for what you're going to do in that real world, which is to come. You, you, you won't have to learn it all over again. You're being groomed. If you paint pictures, if you know how to teach, if you know how to lead, you're being groomed now. <coughs> Hopefully, I'll know how to grow tomato plants. You're being groomed now for the things you're going to do then, because they will be real things done in a real world by real bodies. And so, here we are now, 
one minute after you die into the intermediate state, a real existence in cities with one another, and then the transition at the time of the second coming into the resurrection state when we will live on this earth, the city coming down to this earth after it has been cleansed with fire to live a real life in a real world doing real things with real people. The promise of scripture. Are you ready for death? Ready for that eternity? Love Jesus. Live forever. Good morning, everyone. Have a wonderful day.